Boom. Oh, I forgot to take my liver today. Low energy show incoming. <laughs> That's right, Mark. I'll make up for it. Welcome everybody to another episode of the self, what are we calling it? Not self mastery show. I've been doing so much self mastery work for the self mastery club. This is man versus world. That's what we're doing. Man versus world. What episode are we on now, Pete? I think we're on number 11. Number 11. Look at us. Look at us just chugging along here. Uh, hopefully you guys have been enjoying the show. I know I've had a lot of guys uh, tell me that they just really enjoy just being able to pop it on the background and just have it listen like some good kind of like high quality listening where it's like it's not going to be dumbing you down it's not going to be filling you with negativity or anything like that it's just something you can just kind of throw on and hopefully upgrade your mindset and your attitude a little bit um and there's something i want to be talking to you guys about so last week we launched self mastery club and if you want to learn more about the self mastery club that's our new platform for helping guys become the men that they're meant to be and we have a web class okay and this web class is called how to crack the code to fitness money and sex without selling your soul or becoming a disciplined robot and we ran this last week guys loved it they thought it was fantastic huge amounts of engagement we got a ton of people there um, but there was some issues with some of the emails sending out properly to people so I know some people might have missed it and then I had a bunch of guys telling me that they just couldn't make it at that time so because of that we're gonna actually be running an encore uh, version of that web class and you can check it out this Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern all you got to do is click the link below and uh, join us then because I think you're gonna really like the content there and I'm gonna introduce the self mastery club as well and and all kinds of stuff so it's a great time hopefully I will see you there um, go ahead Pete yeah it's gonna be a good time I'm looking forward to seeing you guys there I'll be in the chat I won't be on on the screen but I'll be in there and I'll be hanging out with you guys so I'm looking forward to that but without further ado let's jump right in here so the first clip comes to us from Myron Golden. And uh, if you don't know Myron Golden, he's kind of a, a professional, wealthy guy. Uh, you know, he does the, the usual stuff. He's a speaker, an author, a coach, all these kinds of things. He's got a lot of wisdom when it comes to uh, making money. And this is the four ways to make money, according to Myron Golden. Let's check it out. All right, let's look at it. Where are you looking at money from? Are you looking at money from the perspective of a rich person, a poor person, or a middle class person? If you're this person, your psychology around money, your, your name is probably Haj. We're gonna call you Haj, right? You say, Haj, what's that, what's that mean? It means have a job. The way to make money is to have a job. What does that mean? That means you sell a whole bunch of your time for a little bit of somebody else's money. Then what you do is you're like, this have a job thing ain't working. So you go over here, you go over here to this guy and your name becomes Oj. Say, Oj, who's Oj? Oj is own a job. And most people, what they do, they think they wanna become entrepreneurs. And so what they do is they go out and they buy a business or, the, or they start a business where they are the only person working in that business. Well. That is not, that, that's not owning a business. Most people think they own a business, but what they really own is a job. So what do I want to do? You don't want to be this guy, you want to be this guy. You want to be OS. OS, what's that? Own a system. What's a system? A system is some mechanism that you use that makes you money every month. The last guy you want to become is you want to, you want to become the SMS, SMS, okay? We'll call him Sam, okay? So Sam's, what, do, what does Sam's do? Sam's sows money seeds. What do you do there? You're investing your money. You're planting your money in the ground and making that money grow out of the ground. This is why these two people are sad. Over here, you're using time to make money. You have neither money nor time. Over here, you have more money, but you have no time to enjoy it. When you come up here, now you're finally making more money and you have the time to enjoy it. And then ultimately, when this takes over this space, now you've got, your, you've got so much money coming in. You've got all the money you need and all the time to enjoy it. Mm. That's actually a really good way of putting it. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people who work for themselves, own a business, whatever, they're definitely owning a job. You know, I would still be for sure in that category. And I think if you want to become like independently wealthy and you don't want to have your income particularly tied to like the amount of hours you put in uh, to something a day, then, yeah, this is the path you want to go. Like the, the highest leverage position you could be in is basically that investor 
basically like your job is to make good decisions. I'll put money here and maybe I'll talk with a few people and then that'll give me more money on the other side. For sure, that's the highest leverage position you can get into. And I think one of the things you got to watch out for when you're in kind of like the money sphere, uh, like, you know, the make money online space or any of the wealth creation stuff is that they always kind of idolize that sort of end goal. And while that's fantastic, uh, and for a lot of people that would be great, for just bottom line reality is that a lot of people just aren't going to get there. They're just not wired that way. Because to get to that point, it takes a very specific kind of person who is uh, willing to do a lot, <laughs> willing to put in a massive amount of personal computational energy into reaching that point. Now, of course, you can always point to exceptions of people who got there relatively easy, especially if they had uh, help from you know wealthier parents and things like that. But there's nothing wrong with having a job. Like he has that down there as like a unhappy face. And like, thank God there are people that have a job, right? Thank God there are electricians and, you know, uh, plumbers and tradesmen and construction workers and people like that who make the world go round. Um, like, that's great, okay? Like you can have a job and it can be okay. It can actually be fantastic. It can actually be the path that you're meant to walk. And I feel like I have to point that out because... Uh, I feel like there's such an underselling of traditional trades in the world. Everybody's like, I heard this new term. It was really interesting. It's called the, they call it the laptop class. So many people today are in the the laptop class, which means you're just like sitting on a you know laptop working from home today doing, you know, some kind of bullshit at a corporate company that like you don't really care about and, you know, doesn't really make an impact in the world and that sort of thing. And you're so disconnected from providing actual value in the world. And it's funny, like you guys know, I just I just moved, and before I moved, I had to get um, some some junk picked up. And the guy who came picked it up, he you know called himself the garbage man, and that's how he answered the phone. It's like blah blah blah, I'm the blah 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 the garbage man. And he was there, and I was talking to him about it, and he he's been he'd been doing that work for twenty something years, I think, and he was just telling me about how like he I really respected him a lot because he first worked at like a major garbage company like um you know I, th I think it was bfi i think that might be a global brand um but it's basically like a big garbage company that was, went global and uh he said it started just getting into being about profits and stuff like that where like they would fire people um just because the the managers wanted to make the numbers look better it's like we covered this much ground but with only this few employees and it's like they would just fire him because it was the end of the month they wanted to make this report for their bosses look better and so he quit he's like this is bullshit like this is not about how you should do things. This is this has nothing to do with providing a better service to the customer. In fact, it actually screws us over because now we're understaffed. And while you looked good on that report, our quality of service is going to decline. And so he decided he wanted to become a garbage man. And he just he's like solo who would go pick up people's stuff. And he liked it because it let him see him helping other people firsthand. Like they have a bunch of stuff. They don't know how to get rid of it. Where I lived before in Massachusetts, it's a massive pain in the ass to get rid of anything because they don't have like any dumps or anything like that. And it's like, you can only put stuff into your, uh, you know, garbage can. It's just like, it's just hard to get rid of things. And so he, they would come and take care of it. And he felt like being able to just have a tangible impact on someone's life was fulfilling to him. And he got to be outside and, you know, there's pluses and minuses talking about it. But like the bottom line is that he felt like he was rewarded for his service and he was doing a good thing. And I guess my whole point about a <laughs> clip talking about higher leverage wealth creation is that that's not the only path, okay? Like you can just actually have a job that you feel good about doing that provides some service to the world. And that could be great. That could be exactly what you're meant to to do. And you can always get into other stuff on the side. You can always get into investing on the side. Like investing is always something that you can do. It's like, you know, so I guess from where I stand, like, I don't want to be at that point yet. Like, I don't even think I could be like, I, there's just too much I want to create. There's too much I want to make. And like me actively, right? Like me, I, I want it. I, I like this right now. And maybe eventually I'll get to the point where like, yeah, if, extreme financial freedom would let me potentially create more, but I don't know. I'm enjoying the game as it stands right now. Um, you know, I wouldn't turn down a million dollars if someone offered it to me, but at the end of the day, like don't let your perceptions be warped. Bottom line is like, if you want to be, um, satisfied in your career, it's like, find a problem, 
that you're willing to care about. And that's where you can find your path, right? It's like if you're willing to care about someone's problem and provide a service to help them overcome that problem, well, then you're going to be able to be employable. So I don't know. Does, what do you think, Pete? What Was it uh, – who's the dirty jobs guy? What's his name? Mike Rowe. Yeah, he, he kind of has an idea about that too. You know, he, he says, I never thought I would meet someone who was passionate about pumping out septic tanks, but yet here we are. You know, like it's crazy. So, yeah. Well, that's that, – there's so many like weird just like businesses out there. Like uh, I have an uncle who's like into stuff like that. Like, um, you know, like, like just – like refurbishing and selling like industrial cleaning equipment, like those big floor cleaners and stuff like that. Like there's so many things you can do. And it's just like, it's all right if you're into something weird. Like I know there's one guy on Twitter that I follow. I think Nick Huberman, I think something Huberman. I don't know. And he's like into like selling self storage units and he's gotten, you know, like successful doing that. It's like find your weird little thing that you think is interesting. It's like, it's just learning how to play a game. And if you can learn how to play a game, almost always you can eventually move to the top, start scaling and that sort of thing. It just doesn't need to be, you know, through selling crypto or going like the the traditional financial route and like money management and all that kind of crap. There's all different ways to play the financial game. So be willing to experiment. All righty. Next clip, we got a clip from Larry Wills, who's a professional lifter of heavy stuff, um, I think is the best way to describe it and there's a great example of somebody who's uh you know picked a interesting niche and been very successful at it although i think he's been experimenting with other uh forms of income recently that uh is kind of interesting but that's not what this clip is this clip is a uh an interview with bradley martin and him and it's very quick so you guys gotta gotta pay attention here to catch all the information but they talk about no not november and training advice for people just starting out wait that's bradley martin i think so Oh, wow. He looks a lot different. All right, let's see. On No Nut November. I have a very high libido due to anabolics, and I can't make more than three days without busting a nut. You could... Okay. Oh, that's Noel. Sorry, that's not Bradley Martin. Sorry, guys. That's Noel Diesel. My bad. Okay. <laughs> I was like, whoa, he really looks different. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's that's interesting. Like, you know, I have a very high libido due to anabolics, so I can't go more than three days. I, I know that... Um, Anabolics increases your libido, but I don't know if it increases it much more than like just normal optimum like hormone levels. And also like I'm pretty sure that uh, like if you take how old is he like 20s, like late 20s, maybe like early 30s. Um, yeah, probably late take 20s. a guy like that on anabolics compared to like your typical teenager. I don't imagine his his sex drive is that much bigger. I'm no expert on on anabolics, so I mean, I mean, with these guns, you might be you might be wondering, but <laughs> uh, I don't I don't really think it actually makes it that much higher. So I could I could like I said I could be wrong, but I think that sounds a bit like an excuse. But I do also know that he's kind of he's in the he's in the the, the game of that uh, as it were, because I know like the the girl he was dating for a while. I used to follow him on Instagram, and then it was just it just got dumb. Actually, this is when I stopped following him was when his girlfriend, who, you know, would always scantily, uh, just scantily would uh, like shake her butt and he would be there filming it and trying to like encourage people to sign up to her OnlyFans. So, you know, he can't he can't be a supporter of No Nut November when he's peddling OnlyFans crap. That's so, true. Um, yeah. And then just a side note to anyone else who has that. Um, mentality of oh I have I have such a high sex drive I can't I can't do no nut November or quit porn or something like that it's because you're addicted like that's really what it is like back when I was a, a kid I was like you know I was a good little Catholic boy and I was in high school and I think I was like 15 at the time and I was trying to give up like jerking off and porn and stuff for Lent which is like a 40 day period where you're supposed to fast and stuff and uh, I remember like 30 days into it, I thought I was dying. I just like was in a horrible mood. I felt like I was going to explode. I was like depressed and angry at the same time. And uh, I remember I relapsed and I felt so much better that I just started cracking up. I was just like, <laughs> and it like at that point, I stopped trying to quit uh, stuff for a number of years because I thought, oh, well, if this if it feels this much better then clearly my body needs this and all like the the, you know, my religious leaders like, you know, the 
you know, the priests and whatever at my school, like they were just full of crap and they didn't understand it. Um, what I didn't realize back at that point was that I was already fully addicted to porn and masturbation. And what I was actually experiencing was withdrawal. And that withdrawal would have gone away <clears throat> if I stuck with the process. Uh, so that's one of the things you want to keep in mind is that if you're struggling to quit porn, master your sexuality, something like that, is that there will be an uncomfortable period where you feel like, you know, strong cravings and it can be, you know, not very pleasant, but it's temporary. It's, you know, it's not this thing where it's like, oh, if I quit this, this is how I feel for the rest of my life, only progressively worse. It's like, no, it's not like this thing where there's this constantly mounting pressure till eventually your eyeballs pop out of your head. OK, that's, that's not the way it goes. It goes in like kind of waves and it reaches a bit of a crescendo where you're getting you know more frequent waves at, you know, uh, you know, per day. But even then. A craving won't last more than like 15 minutes. You know, don't be a wuss. It's just like you let the wave pass and then eventually the frequency of those waves decreases and then you just don't really crave it too much anymore and you're free from that, all that crap. So, yeah. good. Because I think there's still more of this clip. Well, yeah, there's actually more of this clip. So let's, let's, uh, let's get to the second part here. Have any physique in the world, whose would it be? Chris Bumstead, beautiful physique. Chris Bumstead. I never even heard of him. Really? Look at that's that's no. Mr. Olympian. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Last time I knew who Mr. Olympia was was wait no, it was Jay Cutler and then it was that other dude for a while. Uh, I can't remember. I don't know. But look <laughs> at that face. Look at his face. Look how light his face is and how dark his body is. That's, that's ridiculous. Insane. Why do they do that? Does it it's like more make, more definition? Sense? Does it? Yeah. So it's like African American guys just have a natural advantage, I guess. They do, but you know what's funny is they do it too. So everybody doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. With my strength. <laughs> Best advice to someone that's getting into lifting? Work with a coach. If you can't find a coach to work with face-to-face -face, you don't have the funds, then hop on a structured program. Find a competition that interests you because competing brings the best out of you. Thoughts on... That's interesting. So he makes some really good points. Like if you're really trying to... Uh, do anything with any sort of seriousness, you have to involve other people, right? You have to bring someone else on board, whether it's a coach or a lifting buddy or something like that, because this fundamentally changes the way your brain works. We are social creatures, right? Like we are designed to operate in packs. And because of that, a huge amount of our neural processing is dedicated to social interactions. So as soon as you take a goal and you apply another person to it, you're not just using the part of your brain that you use when you're operating solo, you're now also using the social component, which gives you just so much more power. This is one of the fundamental ideas that I've used to construct the Self Mastery Club. It's like I kind of built it around this social concept because it lets you like take your uh, willpower and just magnify it, right? It just it's like giving you the 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 world's lo like a, a much longer lever on your willpower. Um, it's it's like I'm trying to think of a good example of this sort of leverage. I'll have to think about that. I'll come back with you <laughs> with 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 better imagery with it. But it's it's pretty much just like plugging your willpower into a machine that makes it even more power. It's like <laughs> like if your normal willpower for solo endeavors is like a normal little Power Ranger like out of their mech. Well, like you in a social con concept like construct like social setting like a group or with a coach or something like that. That's like you plugging into the Megazoid. Um, <laughs> Does that make sense? Do you do people in your generation even know who Power Rangers are, Pete? Vaguely, yes. Vaguely, okay, yeah, okay. I think that, I think that was a good analogy. Well, I think it's a great analogy. Let's roll with it. <laughs> all right. Uh, so that's that was that one. What else? Alrighty. We got today? So you know, with the whole Amber Heard story being smudged around the internet, you know, I didn't look into. I, I look. I don't read the news, so I don't really know the details. But I heard a few things here and there. And it brought to, to mind something that I wanted to get your take on. And we may have actually talked about this a little bit in a previous episode, but we all know that guy. And maybe maybe you listening to this, maybe you're that guy. And I, I'm not judging you at all because we all, we all know him if we're not him ourselves. But we all know that guy who's been bamboozled into dating a hot chick only for her to later reveal that she is, in fact, a bona fide crazy person, Right. Right. So how how can we see through the facade, you know, before becoming entangled 
That's mm. that's what I want to know. That's a good question. But I think it goes a little bit deeper than that, and it's not so straightforward because that question presupposes that a guy doesn't want to be with a crazy girl. And if he just knew she was crazy <laughs> to begin with, then right. he wouldn't he wouldn't be with her. I don't think that's true. I think mm-hmm. that some guys in particular, um, and like, like there's a there's an allure to crazy. Okay, crazy is interesting. At least it can that's be. That's true. You know, it can also be infuriating and horrible, but crazy can also be interesting and compelling, and it can also lead to extreme sexual chemistry, right? And so it's uh, it's one of those things where it's not so cut and dry because maybe you find that nice, safe, boring um, girl, but uh, maybe you're not actually that into her. Meanwhile, that like, you know, tatted up crazy chick uh, is, you know, super enticing and interesting. And so, like, I, I think the the key to it all, really, is don't have sex before marriage. <laughs> now, as as weird as that sounds, like, let me, let, me, let me pitch to you how I would date today if I wasn't married, okay? Mm. The way that I would date is I would, like, you know, use the dating apps and do everything like that, but I would be super upfront that I'm looking for marriage and that I'm not going to have sex prior to marriage. And that I'm also, I would let all the girls know that I'm going to date multiple women at the same time. And uh, pretty much let them know that, hey, you're all competing for me. And I value my sexuality so much mm-hmm. uh, because I understand how powerful it is. And I'm not going to give any of you a piece of it until you prove to me that you're the one who deserves it. <clears throat> and then we're going to get married and all that kind of stuff. And that's the way I would actually approach dating today and guys like to tell me how oh i can't do that oh girls oh they just want to have sex oh hookup culture blah 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 it's like you have no idea how much you would stand out if you were able to hold that pers- that mindset authentically like i can't prove it because i'm not doing it but i can almost guarantee from what i understand about like everything from marketing to human psychology to whatever is like if you hold yourself above in that way and you hold it back voluntarily on purpose because basically you're saying, hey, you got to prove yourself to me, that is a powerful dynamic. Assuming the rest of your personality in life is you know, in order, um, that's the way I would do it. And I think if you do it like that, then you're going to find, you're going to see the truth of what you think of another person. And I think most guys today, they just don't do that. They, they just hop right into a, a physically intimate relationship and as soon as you do that, you can't judge the person objectively anymore, right? So this is where guys will get really bamboozled by that crazy chick because if you jump right into the sex, sex might be great, super exciting, spicy, whatever. But as soon as you do that, your hormones are all jacked up, your pair bonding mechanisms kicked in, and you're not going to be able to objectively evaluate the quality of your relationship. And, you know, if a lot of your relationship just revolves around sex, well, you know, experientially, it's like, oh, whenever I'm around her, oh, I just have, I just had the best time. It's like, well, yeah, because you're having like, you know, exciting sex, okay? But like, you're not actually realizing, oh, wow, we never, we can't actually go two minutes in silence together. Or, oh, she never asks me about myself. Or, oh, she's got some really weird habits that she does that make me a little bit suspect of her overall intentions and behavior. So it's like, if you let sex come in or particularly early, it's going to cloud your judgment so much that you are going to end up with a crazy chick. If you're not having sex with her, you're going to be able to very clearly see what kind of crazy she is. Is it an enticing crazy that you're willing to potentially, you know, go with in the long run? Or is it uh, the kind of like, ooh, yeah, could be exciting now, but uh, definitely not someone I want to saddle up with. Um, so that's that's what I think is the key. Absolutely. You know, it's it also kind of comes back that dynamic it's like do you want to be selected or do you want to select most right. guys don't have the self control to select exactly right cuz most guys are in this kind of simping mentality you know they're in this idea of oh i need sex that's the bottom line is that it's because it doesn't even have anything to do with women all right it has everything to do with the way that they interact with themselves like with their own sexual charge they can't hold it right they're used to jerk it off to porn you know every day And so if a girl offers them sex, they feel like they have to say yes because whenever their body asks for sex, they give it to it themselves, right? So they have no frame of reference where they can have a sexual attraction that they don't act on. 
And as soon as that's the case, well, then you are in simp mode, no matter what, to every woman. And so the solution that like the red pill tough guys have come up with is that you got to spin plates. It's like, yeah, you're still completely sexually compulsive, but at least you can tell her, well, I'm not going to have sex with you because I got a line of other women to have sex with. When in reality, you can generate a similar sort of thing. It's not the same thing um, by simply saying, no, I have my own sexual values and I am not a slave to my sexual impulses. And so I think that that's that's the better way to do it because I think the whole spinning plates thing is going to be causing you even more problems over time. Absolutely. All right. This next clip here, it made me laugh, but it also made me hurt inside a little bit at the same time. Okay. Let's check this out. Head on my shoulder. Hold me in your arms, baby. Go. Both hands on a bat when I tap it, grab it and slap it. Becky is savage. Head oh on my yeah. shoulder. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been a cultural shift, that's for sure, right? Uh, it becomes so apparent when you put it side by side like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it, it's like you just turn it, it's become so transactional, right? It's that, that's all it is. It's like, how quickly can I get my, my rocks off with you, right? And you are just a, a play thing to me. You are essentially a more interesting fleshlight, and that's that's the basis of our interaction. And because that's the basis of our interaction, then, well, that's what I'm gonna sing about. That's what talking about girls is today, right? Because that's the popular way things roll out. But it's what we see in the older stuff, right? Like they, my, my assumption is that, you know, good sex didn't start in this generation. I would argue that sex probably They've been couples who had good sex, bad sex, all throughout history, right? But the thing that you see with the older, like, dynamic there, you know, back in the 50s, men singing about women. Yeah, just for our audio listeners real quick, it just occurred to me, they have no idea what we're talking about. So the first clip was guys singing about women in the 50s versus today, if you didn't, weren't able to put those together. But yeah, Yeah, anyway, what were you saying? So it's just like, the first one's like, put your head on my shoulders kind of thing. And the second one is just like, you know, bend you over, smack your ass, you know, that kind of thing. And what I was saying is that, like, the older perspective, it was still sexual, right? Like, the romance was never has never not been about sex, okay? So they still had that, and my assumption is that they still probably had great sex. In fact, many of them probably even had better sex because, you know, monogamy and you know, saving yourself to marriage and all that kind of stuff was, uh, and there was less porn and all that kind of stuff. It was just... I think a better setup for an actually good sex life. But for them, the relationship wasn't just sex. It also had romance. It also had intimacy. It also had companionship. This is something that is being phased out of relationships today. So like Tinder culture, that's not about love. That's not about intimacy. That's not about like true companionship. That's just about, hey, can we have sex or not, right? And so the the scope of pleasures that is being offered to people today is so much less. It's like taking this beautiful like four course meal from a five star restaurant and turning it into like a thing of McDonald's McNuggets. Okay, it's like pretty one dimensional. I'm not saying McNuggets are bad. I mean they're probably bad for you, uh, especially like that. But like, yeah, I think it's actually a perfect analogy because like inherently. Chicken nuggets are not bad for you, but the way it's prepared uh, at McDonald's for you, like, yeah, it might be tasty in the moment, but that shit's going to cause you problems. Same with the way that sex is being divorced from intimacy and relationship and it's served to you today. It's going to cause you a lot of problems. And so I, I think we need to have this countercultural movement where it's like, yo, this is this is too far. This is bullshit. This is not going to lead to anything good. And I believe that guys do need to lead this charge because once guys start saying, yeah, this is what I value and this is what I'm looking for and I'm actually going to, well, that's that's a weird thing. I was about to, you know that saying, I'm going to put your, put your uh, money where your mouth your is? Your mouth is. Yeah. I was going to say, put your penis where your mouth is, but you definitely don't, don't want to do that. Don't wanna, you just got to, you got to have your sexual choices match what your values actually say. So if we got a generation of guys who can start doing that, 
they're going to change the game. They're going to change the, cult, the the sexual landscape. And I believe it can actually happen. And maybe I'm naive in thinking that, but that's still what I'm gunning for. Yeah, I hope you're right. And I think, do you think it's culture leads the way and then music will follow? Or do you think music has an impact on that sort of thing? So I think that music allows an individual to amplify their own culture dramatically. Mm. Like just going back to like the 90s, uh, like Kurt Cobain. He created a genre. Almost. That's true. You know, there was like other people, but he took his personal culture and used his music to magnify it. That's what art does. Art allows someone to take their culture and transform it and make it bigger. That's what Jordan Peterson arguably does. You know, he's his his work, his intellectual work, his processing, that's that's his art. And he's put it out into the world. And that has, I think, absolutely impacted the world, right? And so uh I think it's got to be a synergistic sort of thing. We're both got to go. Both the uh, you need to have the art to support it, as well as the uh, the individuals who are willing to to lead the way and, and embrace it. All right, songwriters listening, get on it. You got a lot of work to do, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for Alrighty. sure. All right. So our last clip for today comes to us from Hybrid Calisthenics, and he's talking about how he abstains once a week to make his life more enjoyable. So once a week, I like to have like a purge day, usually Tuesdays. It's one day a week where I abstain from an impulse or something that gives me pleasure. This could be video games, social media, watching TV, processed sugar, any kind of impulse or escapism. For me, it's coffee and tea. No caffeine on Tuesdays, none. It doesn't even have to be something that's bad for you. I think it's healthy to know that we have the self-restraint and impulse control necessary to do this. And you'll like this next part. This makes it more enjoyable when we come back to it. Wednesdays are my favorite days of the week. Just sharing something that I do. Try it out and see how you like it. He's a friendly dude. I never he seen is. him before. I liked his. I liked his vibe. Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. Hello, my friends. Oops. It is your brother. Turn off autoplay. Um, so that general idea that can be good. Yeah, for sure. Take a break from things. But I would actually, I would take it much farther than him personally. I think instead of taking one day off from something a week, if you really want to maximize like your enjoyment of it, you should take six days off of it and then have it like once a week as like a special treat. So uh, that's what, what I've done with coffee. Like I quit it cold turkey. Um, Doesn't that give that, you headaches though? Uh, it sucks for like two weeks. <laughs> the third week starts getting better. But like I was like a, you know, multiple, like, you know, one to two cups a day kind of guy. Um, and then during the pandemic, it kind of crept up because I got the unlimited coffee subscription at Panera because that was the only place that I could go to work without a mask. And uh, I also could get out of the basement that I was in. And I just like needed to get out of that freaking basement, to do some work. So I was there and I would just start pounding coffee and stuff like that. And it got, you know, I was up to like two and a half, three a day. And uh, that was not good for me because I realized that it was just making me crash really hard and I couldn't function without it. So I cut it and um, yeah, it sucks hard for uh, like two weeks. Like I just felt not great. But then my energy started to come back. And if you shift your diet with it too, ideally like a more like a lower carb diet throughout the day, your energy levels can be pretty fantastic. You throw a raw liver on top of it, it's like jet fuel. But anyway, um, my point is now that like I can have like a decaf coffee every once in a while and it feels like a treat. And if I want like a real treat, like I'm like trying to like, you know, I'm going to be meeting with a, a friend or something. And I really just want to like get into the conversation and like really load into it. Well, getting a cup of coffee then is like a major, major wonderful thing. And it's like this is the same idea behind having like a cheat day and a diet. Right. People wouldn't say, hey, have a shit diet for six days a week. And then on this on like the seventh day, eat healthy. Right. Like I think most of us today, a lot of our day to day activities are unhealthy. OK, so it's like the better way to do it is to try and abstain from generally unhealthy things. And then you bring them back as these little these little like cheat days, these little treats, whatever you want to call them. And that's where they're I think they're most enjoyable, because if you really moderate it properly, there's not even any downside to it then. But it, when it's an almost everyday sort of thing you're still going to be getting whatever the negatives are from that thing. So I like his idea. Um, and maybe for some stuff that works good. Like if you got some, some smaller things that you're not willing to really make a bigger shift on, like clearly this is easier 
But for many people, like you're never really going to get the main benefit from it. So if you like play video games every day of the week except for one, well, that day you're still probably going to crave video games. And so you're never going to actually get to that point where you stop craving the thing on your off day. You need a, a longer period of abstinence to allow for actual adaptation so that on those off days you feel fine, but then on the day where you allow the indulgence, it's just a little extra sweet. So uh, that's how I would approach it. Nice. You know, there's a lot of things that you could apply this to. There's a lot of things you could abstain from, but man, I tell you from personal experience is one thing you, you just don't want to do this with. What's that? What? Would you say there's one thing you just don't want to do this with? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You never, you de- you definitely do not want to do this. With the upcoming webinar this Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, I'll see you there. <laughs> you got me. You got me. You got them. All right, guys. So uh, thank you so much for coming in, tuning into our show. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Like Pete said, this Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern time, we have a web class where we'll be cracking the code to fitness, money, and sex without selling your soul or becoming a disciplined robot. This is some really cool stuff. Uh, even if you've been following me for a while, I think you're going to dig it a ton. And it's going to be telling you a lot more about the Self Mastery Club that I'm going to be unrolling here, which is going to be, I think, completely game changing. So check out the link below. I'll see you, hopefully, all then. Oh, yeah.